Welcome to episode 73 of the Trash Talk Business Podcast. As always, we come together once a week to talk about how to grow, scale, and build your junk removal dream. So whether you're in demolition, deconstruction, junk removal, landscaping, I don't care. If you're doing home services, you've come to the right place to learn from the people that have done it before, and we figure things out along the way. Always, or as always, normally, this is the time where I'm like, as always, I'm Andy Wines, and here's Casey Bubba Lawrence. However, uh, Casey is uh, MIA. He's out there pounding the pavement, doing work. He was running late. We're not. So he'll be joining us later in the podcast. So this is normal where I kick it over to Casey. We do a little banter. We're going to skip all that. And I will introduce our first guest, our first guest, our guest this week, Uzair, who found us, uh, you know, every week on the podcast, we talk about, hey, we want to meet people that have interesting stories and, and how they can potentially benefit other people in the home services businesses. And so Uzair hit me up on a, a third party platform and said, hey, I should be on your podcast. And I said, <laughs> cool. And that is the extent of what I know about him. And that's the beautiful thing. We're going to get into it talk about it and see what value we can add to you as the listener. So who's there? Welcome to the podcast. What is it you do and why are you here? Um, so I started a mobile mechanic business okay. eight years ago and I grew it to the point where it kept on growing and running itself. It was like a very automated business. Hmm. And while running my mobile mechanic business, I thought that I was a in the mechanic business, but it turns out I was in the home service industry. So yep. when I learned about how plumbing businesses and HVAC and all these companies ran, I was like, that's exactly what I'm doing. So my thesis was when I started this business was no one is doing this because they haven't been able to figure out how to make this business work. And I thought that by building our own tech, automating everything, that we would be the ones to make it work. Turns out it's a very difficult business to run. And there's a reason mm -hmm. why no one makes it work. Because unlike a home service business where people have no options but to have someone come to their house and spend a lot of money on their house. When it comes to my business, people have options. They can just drive to a shop, right? So yeah. we uh, took a lot of years to crack that code. And when we finally did, I, I went on a little journey because I had nothing to do anymore. Business <laughs> was going to the point where they don't, I, it was doing better without me. Like I, I could only mess things up at that point, right? So I was like, hey, let's yeah. go let them do what they're doing. And then I discovered just talking to people that a lot of my friends that running home service companies did not know how to do the same. I thought what came natural to me was actually pretty difficult. So I started helping my friends out with their businesses, coming up with systems, building out automations for them as well. And then I realized the market for it. So I started this year um, working with home service companies in everything from landscaping to HVAC, plumbing, painting and building out automations for their business so that they can just figure out a way to just get away from the day-to-day -day and have mm -hmm. their business grow, but at the same time, know exactly what's going on in their business. So it's not like they're completely hands-off and they see everything for the first time. All right. No, I like what you're saying. So one of the things I teach a, a course called the Six Buckets of Business, and we do, you know, there's, there's the six buckets, which is marketing, sales, operations, the thing you do, resources that are human, and the numbers. And I, mm -hmm. I give people the evaluation, right? Rank your, rank your, those six with the definition in order. And you have your high three and low three. And I'm not so concerned about your one, two, or three. I care about the high three. If it's a high three, that's where you need to spend your time. If it's a low three, that's where you do not need to spend your time. Mm -hmm. And when you have these things within your business, you have one of three things you can do. You can either delegate, automate, or eliminate. So typically delegate means you you know how to do it. You're good at it. You have a high skill, a low will or desire to do it. And so you delegate it to somebody else and you can check it on their work. Automation is similar, except that automation, it happens in the background. You build the process or the system so that it mean, needs very few humans to interact to make, make it a go. And then the first bucket is eliminate. And that's when it's something you have a low skill at, a low will at, nobody else on your team can oversee it or monitor it. So eliminate, doesn't mean you eliminate it from your business, you eliminate it from your headspace, and so you hire it out. So for mm -hmm. example, like like writing contracts is a really simple one that you can eliminate. Yeah. Hire a lawyer, they have one already built, put in the names, make sure it looks good, have someone sign it, right? Eliminate it from your workload, because if you had to sit down and write a contract, right, find a lawyer, 250, 300 bucks an hour, that can get it done in an hour, otherwise it'll take you a month or whatever it is. So 
let's talk about this automation. Is what you're doing, is it a tool? Is it a consulting service? What What is the thing people can buy from you? Um, and this certainly is not going to be a 45 minute to an hour sales pitch. More it's, I want to understand what is exactly you sell now. And then I want to talk about what are some tactics and techniques, right? Give away a little of the secret sauce so that people can start implementing now potentially some of these things. Because it's like anything else. Once you implement one or one or two, you're going to get the low-hanging fruit. And then eventually, you get to a point where it's like, okay, I don't know how to make further implementations. I got to bring in this mm -hmm. third-party somebody. So yeah. what is it? Is it a tool? Is it consulting? So I do both. I do uh, consulting, and I also build out cost, custom automations for people. So it requires, depends on what they need. I can build it using the tools like Zapier or Make, or sometimes mm -hmm. even have to custom make custom Python scripts. It's whatever they need, right? So I can build custom tools for them and automations. And I also do consulting on the side uh, as, as well, depending on where they are in their business. So the way I look at it is if they have strong systems and SOPs and everything already in place, yep. then I can build out the automations. We just, they already have everything. Now my, turn, my job is to build out the automations for certain things. But if they don't have strong SOPs and systems in place, then it's going to be more of a consulting role. And then we build out the automations. Okay, so let's 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 game plan. So we have two, two and that's really good. So let's talk. So, so about half of our audience members are, I'd say, in junk removal less than uh, junk removal or home services. We're starting to get landscapers and other ad, 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 adjacent businesses. Um, I say about a half of our. I say let's break it down in thirds. I like things, you know, in mm -hmm. thirds. Uh, life is in thirds. So one third of our listeners are side hustle to first two years in business. Yeah. One third of our listeners are. What are one plus years and they're, and they're running crews, maybe, you know, four or five years in business and they got multiple mm -hmm. crews and they're working on the business. And then one third of our listeners are people that are kind of on the fringe watching. It's like side hustle at best. They haven't even jumped in a, as full time or they're straight listening because they sell to businesses like ours. And so I want to mm -hmm. focus on let's focus first on the importance of SOPs. We talk about on this podcast all the time. Document everything. One of the last episodes or episode before that, Casey and I spent 45 minutes to an hour basically saying, when you're doing stuff early in your business, write down the best way of doing it. And then you have an opportunity to teach it more effectively and also learn from it. Like really, was this the best way? It might be the way you do it. it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way. So let's talk to what are some of the gaps you're seeing? So, you know, put your consulting hat on. Hat on. What are some of the gaps you're seeing in businesses and the best practices so that they can get to that point of established SOPs. So what I'm seeing right now is a, there's two options, right? There's people that know they need to build SOPs, but they don't actually do it. And there's ones mm -hmm. that do build the SOPs, but they're just not done in a way that's effective. Okay. Right. And so let's talk about the ones that know they need to build SOPs, but they don't do it. And I can see why. It's because they have so many more important things to do. They're just like, oh, I got new ideas. I got to try this out. I have, I've got to worry about sales. I got to worry about marketing. Oh, my tech just quit. Like the last thing I need to worry about is SOPs, right? It's, but, yeah, great. You're, you're, you're not future focused. You're living right in the absolute truck broke down, shit at the fan present. Yes. Like half the problems you're dealing with right now is because you didn't have the SOPs to begin with. You didn't systemize, you didn't <laughs> Say, work on your hold business. On. Hold on. Say that again. Say that again so the people in the back can hear you. Half of the problems that you're dealing with right now is because you didn't build the SOPs in the first place. So you're spending oh all God. your time music, in this. Music to my ears. <laughs> quadrant one, urgent and important. You spend all your time there because you didn't spend time yep. on important but not urgent. Yep. Right? And I just like, listen, guys, like, can you do me a favor? As you're doing things in your business, just record it. Get on your iPhone, open your voice recorder, and just talk through the things that you're doing and why you're doing it and send hmm. it to me. I'll transcribe it and I'll build SOPs for you from that, you know, but just give me something to work with because you give me all these ideas and things you want to run with. But at the end of the day, people are going to quit on you. Trucks are going to break down. Customers are going to be unhappy. That's just part of the game. How do we prevent that from happening? Right? Yeah. The other, so one of the tools I use is Otter, which is, you know, it's voice to text. Uh, mm -hmm. Just some predict, not predictive texting, but it, it does predictive uh, um, grammar, sentence structure, things like that. I wrote an entire, or not wrote the entire book, but I started writing my book on Otter. I've written speeches on Otter and I've written SOPs on Otter where you talk yeah. through like, okay, I walk into the house. I greet the customer. I verify the job. I verify pricing. I lower the gate on the truck. 
I introduced mm-hmm. the other team member. Right, like, like just talk through what exactly you do, and then you can add it in. Oh, here he comes. All right, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick pause. Here, we're gonna take a quick pause because we're getting into the meat, the meat of the show. And as we know, when we get in the meat of the show, the meat church minister himself, Mister Casey <laughs> Bubba Lawrence, shows up. Casey, let me tell you something. I was unsure of this guest. I went in. Right, we did our standard. How do you pronounce your name? Cool, hit record. He found us on on Podmatch. I was I was concerned. I'm like, this guy might just try to sell us some shit, and that's fine. We let everybody on the we let every, almost everybody on the show because we want to hear people out. And we, we know we're just warming up the episode. Now you come in with your fucking Texas Rangers fucking <laughs> button up. For those of you guys uh, not watching, Casey's wearing a Texas Rangers shirt, uh, and he bumped it up all the way. What, like, didn't want to show off his tattoos. Anyways, Casey. Something Uzar said a second ago was half the problems you're having today in your business are because you didn't write a SOP yesterday. Something like that. All right. I heard, I saw a bingo. I didn't hear a bingo. This actually might be the best oh. podcast ever. There he is. All right. It would have been the best podcast ever if Casey couldn't talk and only had to listen, especially when we're talking about SOPs, automation, <laughs> documentation, all the yeah. things we just had an entire episode on. So now we talked about why you should do it. Uzar here is going to talk to us about how he does it. So quick recap from like the seven minutes we've been on the, the on the podcast so far. He does consulting. He also does automation using Zapier and other, you know, backend third parties. And his two customers are simple. The ones we're talking about now that don't have SOPs, and we know the myriad of reasons why they don't have them, or two, the people that have SOPs and they want to go next level where the SOPs start to have background automation so it's not as labor or capital intensive. That's 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 where we're at, Casey. How are you doing today? Where where are you, real quick, Casey? Before we jump in, or you're you're in a pickup truck. What state yeah, are you so in? So I'm in Texas. I am in Decatur, Texas. I'm at a park. It looks like a frisbee golf park, which is weird, but it's <laughs> a park golf nonetheless. Park. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, any commercial area, Walmart, Lowe's, anything like that, there's not one shaded parking spot. And wow. uh, my schedule kind of got messed up with today, kind of got pushed. That's why I'm a little late. So I went to a park where I knew they had trees, and I'm getting the shaded <laughs> spot. It's 108 degrees down here. Oh. So shade <laughs> is definitely ne- uh, necessity. Absolutely. Uzar, where, I didn't even ask, where are you from, Uzar? I'm in Edmonton, Canada, Alberta. Yeah, they don't, they don't, it's okay. not 107 okay. there. It's, it's probably like what, like 24 degrees Celsius? What's the temperature today? Like it feels like it. It's like 72, 75. I, I prefer Dude, one. 20, I'm a weight kind of guy. Okay, hold on. That's interesting. 22 Celsius is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. I, I, I only, so my buddy Tyler, Casey, my Tyler, uh, he always says, yeah. clear, he calls it Clear Blue 22. He's a pilot. So Clear Blue 22, which is three miles of visibility and 22 degrees Celsius, 72 degrees is the perfect whatever. So that's how, that's the only reason I know that. All right. Are you from Canada, Edmonton? Yeah. Or where are you from? I've been here for the last 25 years. Okay, hold on. But you, you use Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Don't they use Celsius well, in Canada? You guys, you guys, I, I'm using your, I'm speaking your language here. I, it's true. I, yes, I, speaking I, our, I haven't heard it about a boot. I haven't heard it a boot <laughs> or a mum. So I have a Canadian <laughs> friend. So it's mum and a or boot. A Those are the or two. <laughs> or French What's, fries and gravy. Oh, dude. Poutine. Poutine. I love Poutine. Poutine. <laughs> All right. So before we were so rudely interrupted by Casey in the meat church hat, we were Casey. We were having a very intelligent conversation, mm-hmm. and then you came in. So let's get back to the intelligent conversation. Okay. So the best way to write down SOPs, voice dictate, write down the shit you do. That's yeah. it, right? I mean, so what is what is stopping people? What is is it from your experience? What because because when you say something right now, I want to hear the answer to this. It's going to strike our audience because. The audience right now that hasn't written down SOPs is because you're you're lying to yourself, and and Uzair here is going to tell mm-hmm. you probably what you're lying to yourself about why it's not getting done. It's you 100 percent aren't dedicating the time for it. it's not an important thing for you to do. Like you don't mm. like a thing that you should do as a business owner is treat working on your business time as much as as highly as you treat anything else in your in your life. Like the phone calls, the day to day sales, you should block three to four hours a week working on your business and put that on your calendar and you cannot skip it, but they don't do it. It's just like, it's so frustrating. I'm like, listen, you're paying me to be your babysitter at this point. I would, I didn't sign up to be your babysitter. 
I signed up to be your I'm I'm here to help you grow the business, but I need to dedicate three to four hours a week to work on this stuff. Well, and I'm getting that I'm working on your stuff with you. Like, give me the time. But everyone gets caught up in the day to day. Oh, I got this problem here. I got that problem there. But they're never going to go away. No, I. So Casey does consult, consulting and coaching. I've done coaching and consulting. And for the for what I've realized, I've had one client now, past six months. Most of the clients mm-hmm. I have work with me between three and six months because right around the ninety day mark, that we've done all the low hanging fruit, and now they're like, mm-hmm. wait. I still have to spend, you know, I, 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 you say three to four hours. I, I press people even hard. I'm like eight to 10 hours, right? 20% of your time each week should be on your business. It's not, it's, yeah. it's projects, it's strategy, it's implementation, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's 20% of your, that's, that's not even that much from my perspective. Um, and people aren't even willing to do two or three hours. Like yeah. some people, no, like I this aren't. podcast, the one hour they spend on the podcast a week, they might spend another hour of implementation. And my challenge mm-hmm. is, Spend more than two hours a week on improving your, your fighting position. It's your business, yeah. right? Like two hours a week is a hundred hours a year. That's nothing, right? Like, we'll so, give you the hour. We'll give you the ideas. Now you have to go out and implement. Yeah. I think that, I think one of the biggest issues is instant gratification. Mm. Um, as a society, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Just think about how everything now has been normalized to, if you want something now, you're going to get it. Um, yep. And the thing with business is they don't understand you still have to feed it, right? You still have to mm-hmm. plant the seeds and you still have to go out and do the work. And then, yes, will something come of it? Absolutely. But it's not going to be instantly. Now, um, there was a post on one of the Facebook groups and it was from someone who actually is an admin or founder of the entire group. So he has some sort of, a, I guess you could say authority, but he has some influence and He was saying, hey, who wants to know about these awesome side jobs you could start doing during your slow season? And I made a comment, and I was like, in other words, hey, who wants to take focus off your main business and put it on stuff that doesn't really matter in order to lose money? (laughs) And and I made some some smart-ass comment. Well, then another gentleman pretty much went underneath me and was like, that's the issue we're facing, is that people don't want to take the time they're given to work on their business when it's the most important time and you have the least amount of excuses to do so mm-hmm. they'd rather chase another rabbit down another rabbit hole mm-hmm. and the next thing you know they're like oh i have five different businesses i'm sucking at instead of one i'm doing great at mm-hmm. and and in full transparency i've done it we, you know first yeah. year first like oh let's do snow plowing let's get into this oh what about this we did moving oh let's let's start doing deliveries I mean, I chased and chased and chased and chased, and it was like, well, no, hold on. What? What's coming my way? What are we good at? What do we make money at? And now in our business, we have three areas of focus, and, mm-hmm. and that's it. Mm-hmm. And I used to have four or five businesses. Now I'm down to basically two businesses and a podcast, and that's where I like to live my life, right? And and mm-hmm. and there are two very, very dis- different businesses. It's it's Camel Crew Junk Removal and then um, Young Guns, which I put on uh, networking events. And that that feeds that that feeds part of my networking side, right? So there there mm-hmm. is a somewhat benefit to to Camel Crew, but to Casey's dead on. When you're when you're a fucking junk mold company, all of a sudden like, oh, I'm gonna be a landscaper. Oh, I'm gonna clean your gutters. Oh, I can wash your carpets, dude. Can you? Yes. You're gonna waste a lot of money chasing that. Uh, Mike mm-hmm. McCallowitz talks about it in Profit First. It's you like different than can and should, man. Can and should, yeah, right, like. But anyways, I tell people all the time, they would ask me, hey, can you fix my fence or can you work on my porch? And I'm like, I can absolutely do either of those, but I shouldn't because you don't really want me to. And and, and I won't. I'm not good at building shit, you know? Well, it also doesn't make you money. It's not repeatable for your business. That's why there's fence companies and roofing companies and plumbing companies, right? We we live in a society where you you need to be a specialist. And even junk Mm -hmm. removal, be really, really good at it. Hell, Yesterday, or today, today, or last week, last week, what happened was one of our guys went to uh, a different transfer station than what we're used to, right? And turns out the pricing there was better than the landfill and the transfer station we'd been going to. Why? Because it was one of those things I got stagnant at, right? I'm like, well, this is where we go. And he literally took the wrong turn, pulled in. We get a bill, and it was like, oh, this is less expensive than we're used to paying. Well, that's pretty <laughs> fucking dope, right? So it's like, even in a case like that, it's like, well, where the hell was I? Why wasn't I working on that? Why wasn't I every quarter 
at least reaching out to every landfill and transfer station and redocumenting pricing. Right? Mm-hmm. There, there was a, a simple one-hour task that could have saved me hundreds of dollars in a 90-day period. It's little things like that that make the difference. All right, so That's let's get back. back. So, okay, so we know the importance of documenting things, writing SOPs, figuring out the best practices, scrubbing them. The other thing is have your employees take the SOP and run it verbatim. This is what they mm-hmm. do in the Army. I remember the, I don't know if you ever did this, Casey. They, you'd have to write a process in the Army, a, a step-by-step, and then have us write step-by-step how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then the instructor would read step-by-step how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So they'd be like, open the peanut butter jar, right? So he would like cut a hole in the side of it because now it was open, right? And then it was like, put peanut butter on bread. So he'd take like one little peanut butter and put it on like the, the side edge of the bread. Put jelly on bread, right? And you you realize by about third step into it how not detail oriented it was. You know when we say, "Hey, greet the customer." Well, well what does that look like? Say hi to them. Refer to why? them by their name. You know, introduce yourself. Not just like greet customer. Well, what does it look like? Have those performance steps sure. written out. Yeah, you know, we've said this before. There's a lot of correlations in the military to how you run a business, yep. and the biggest reason why you do these, I call it Barney style. Um, activities and processes is because, okay, in the military, you have privates. They're, they're, they don't know anything. They are like a blank piece of paper. What you teach them, right, and how you train them is how they will develop. In business, your processes, your standard operating procedures need to be so not just um, easy to read, but so uh, easy to follow and pick up and understanding that anyone, and I mean anyone, can go through the same steps and understand it the exact same way every single time. The problem is a lot of us get into the owner operator mode to where, well, no one else can do it as good as I can. No one else is this, um, you know, cares this much or, or whatever, which is very true. No one cares as much, but anyone can do anything as good as you if you train them to do so mm-hmm. and how you train them are on these standard operating procedures. I don't care if it's, hey, after every single job, do a quick sweep of the garage. Make sure there's no more dirt on the floor. Mm -hmm. It may seem stupid to someone, but it's that little thing that if it's the standard and it doesn't get done, it will get noticed. I promise you. So go go ahead. Sorry. I just think that a lot of owner operators don't understand what a business is. A business is nothing but a collection of SOPs at the end of the day. It takes there a bunch of inputs <laughs> and makes the output. And what's in the middle is just a bunch of SOPs, right? If you don't have that, it's not a business. And I think that people yeah. need to understand mm-hmm. that as business owners, they only have four things they can do. Number one, they set the vision, get the right people on board, make sure there's enough money in the bank and people getting paid. And the last thing they can do if they want to do any work is strategic partnerships. Yeah. That's, that's what it's, I mean, every single, you said it right. I, yeah, normally this is where I chime in and and, and, and put a, and, and a caveat. I, I got nothing. But actually, <laughs> yeah. we, no, we do have we do I have like a title. That. Hold on, we do have a title to an es- to our episode though. Biz, what would you say they get about business and SOPs? I want I want I make sure Taylor it's a gets a collection this of out. SOPs. Yeah, right, business is merely a collection of SOPs. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. That's all your business is, right? So if you yeah, don't have that, you're, kind you're, of business. Yeah, like here's your brand standards. Here are the colors we use. Here's the font we use. Here's the yep. logo. That's the SOP. That's how we make, right? Yeah. This is how we make flyers. This is this is how we set our trucks up. This is how we perform jobs. This is how mm-hmm. we close out the day. Close out the day. Everything. This is, how, this is how we market to our customers. And then here's the beautiful thing about SOPs. They're living, breathing documents that have to be continually evaluated and updated. So Taylor, our producer, put in the chat, Great. Now you wrote the SOP. Now what? So who's mm-hmm. on for the people, right? So this is like phase two. Phase one is write the SOP. Phase two is I have an SOP. You know, your second part was build an amazing team. What yeah. what is the best way to implement those SOPs? So the SOPs, they have to be accessible, right? So one thing I like to work with my companies is build like a center hub, central hub for everything. And in that central hub, you have like the vision, people's roles, uh, the organizational structure, the SOPs the CRM, everything is connected in one hub because I want everyone mm-hmm. to be, it could even also just be Slack as well because Slack is really good at that. But I find that if you use too many different pieces of software and everything's all over the place, nothing really gets done. 
And then what you mm -hmm. also do is you can create like an AI, a little Slack bot in your um, whatever Slack or Teams that is trained on your SOPs too. So whenever people have, it could, so you can ask it to like do regular checkups for you. And if anyone has any questions, they can just talk to the Slack bot itself. So they know how to do everything exactly the right way in a very accessible way. So that's what I'm big on is accessibility with whatever you build. So I giggled because I just recently, I'm part of two organizations that are not just veteran and physical based, but they both communicate heavily on Slack. And yeah. I've had to learn uh, on just how to use it. I mean, honestly, it's new to me. And at first I was like, oh, great. Another effing app to have on my phone and notifications, blah, blah, blah. But it's very interesting because, you know, obviously you can make different channels. You can have the main channel. There's one channel to where like the headquarters element, they put out information and we can't respond to it unless we have permissions. Mm -hmm. but at least we get that information. And then there's like another channel that's just for like upcoming announcements, that kind of thing. And it's interesting to me that you brought that up because I just recently started using Slack and mm -hmm. I actually kind of like it, man. Like I'm, I'm actually a fan big time. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Slack is very powerful. We have it so that all the interactions that happen in our business show up on Slack. So when a job is booked, a job is canceled, our daily revenue numbers, our KPIs are hit, um, phone calls coming in, online leads, have they been answered? Um, Everything integrates into Slack. So all different apps that we use from CRM to project management to our field service management tool, they're all integrated into Slack. And you can communicate back and forth with different tools through Slack too. So like I was saying, when I run my entire business, I don't do anything for it. I'm very hands-off. But at the same time, I know everything that's going on to a very granular level. By just opening so, up my Slack. I like that. So uh, yeah. uh, before I forget, so field service uh, software. So we use Jobber. And, and Jobber's a, a supporter of the show. Edmonton Company. What's that? That's an Edmonton company. I, I know. You Canadians, <laughs> you know, you guys love your technology. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so huge fan of Jobber. So I, I always put it out there. Jobber, uh, get Jobber. Go get Jobber.com backslash Camo Crew Junk Removal. If you want to find out more about Jobber, they are supporters of the show, which means you sign up, I get paid, we keep the channel going. So that's as simple as that is. Uh, get that, put that out there so I don't get sued by the FCC or whoever the <laughs> hell is monitoring these days. Because if you get monetized, you gotta you gotta mention it. Um, normally we have our unofficial sponsor, which is whatever hat Casey's wearing, which today, like I, I said from the top, is Meat Church. Uh, <laughs> you have a you have a Giants hat on. What what the hell is that all about? It's just a, I stole this half my friend. I just found it. There we go. All right, there you go. See, that was that like that was the extent of it. I don't give a shit about baseball, but I was like, he's got a Canadian shirt on. Like that makes sense. I got yeah. this. For free. I got this for free. I'm just wearing free swag right now. <laughs> there we go. Free swag. And for those of you listening only, he's got a uh, rainfall waterfall rainforest oh, yeah. picture okay, in the background. So I had this idea okay, because I live in Edmonton and it snows here. It's cold. It's ugly, right? Yeah. I had this idea that in my room, I would paint my wallpaper to be of a nice, beautiful lake. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will trick myself with thinking that I'm somewhere tropical every day. And that there way I don't get depressed. Oh, you right. go to Florida. Yeah, I, was saying, I mean, <laughs> I'd love there's no reason to stay in Canada. All right. Yeah. You said, well, real quick, now, now we're in, we'll, we'll, we'll transition into the, okay, we have an SOP. I like the idea of Slack. I have. God, I'm I am I am the curmudgeon old man. We started using Slack or Discord. We used Discord a couple of years ago, um, and I fucking hated it. It was when I had my market, my media company. I hated using Discord, and then when we started using Slack for stuff, and I heard about Slack, and I'm like, this is stupid. Send me a fucking text message. Um, however, like at some point, when I know Casey's into it, that's where I know that I'm being curmudgeonly. Right? That's it. Uh, all right, I might. I might, I, I need, here, what you're saying is where I'm at, right? It is the, we have the mm -hmm. SOPs. I know where all the information is. I would be lying if I said everybody knows where the information is. I'd be lying if I said somebody knows where all the information is other than me. And it, half the time I got to Google shit on my Google mm -hmm. Drive to find the, in, the the critical piece of information. So now let's talk about that phase. I have SOPs written. There's a general understanding of the business. And yet we're still missing the fucking mark. Mm -hmm. how, 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 how do you automate it so it integrates so everyone's on the same sheet of music? 
So one thing to do that, one thing we've done with our business is like, for I'll give you a simple example, like answering phone calls and booking jobs, right? Yep. There's a process and a script that you have to follow every single time. So what we did is that we noticed that if we change the script or anything that people don't actually follow it. So we built our own little tool called the book service tool. So whenever we get a phone call, they open up this particular tool, which has the flow that they have to follow automatically built there with all the scripts and everything right there and then. And it's done in a way where we can adjust it as well. So if you want to change the script or change the flow, we just change it with the booking script works. And then they go through that flow and click submit and then it pushes everything to our crm as though the job is booked normally but that's just an example of the sops are only as valuable as how people can see them and how available they are right so in this case we put that sop right in their face when they're doing that particular process i'm not gonna lie it's fucking hot. I like the accessibility is key yeah yeah the tool is no good if you don't reach for it and use it all right but how this, big... this sop is so, right in your face and you can't so run away quick. Casey, you missed this. He, he launched a mobile mechanic business. So how big is that business today? Uh, it's a few million dollars a year, and it's in, 20, it's in Western Canada and a few cities. Um, how many trucks, for example? Do, like have, an employee count or truck count? I, check, I, I think we have 10 or 12 trucks now. Okay. All right, that's okay. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah so, so a, um, a, a really, I'd say a higher-end junk and wool company is eight plus trucks, eight to mm -hmm. 10 to 12. I know, like... Uh, was it nice guy? Is it nice guy? What's that one guy? Nice guys. Yeah. Nice guy. He's like oh, a yeah. 10 plus. Yeah. There's, there's a handful of independent 10 truck plus operations. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of junk removal companies are that two to six truck. I would, I would say mm -hmm. that are not owner operators. Owner operators are one to two truck operations. And then like, like Casey, when he was in it, four trucks was his sweet spot. Um, I like to be right yeah, around I went five from to six to four. Yeah. Like, technically, I'm an owner operator. Yeah. Uh, technically, I'm an owner operator. If you look at every sense of the word, I just gave the operation yeah. to, to yeah, but you're, you're, oh. yeah, but you're a hell of a lot more owner than you are operator. Yeah. It doesn't right? hinge on you going yeah. out there and doing the thing. It yeah. doesn't anymore. Yes, you're right. But at the start, yeah. when I was building everything out, I was as well, I, well, I'm not, I can't do any car repair myself. Like, I have, I have zero technical background. Hmm. But I was answering calls, booking jobs, doing sales, doing everything myself, doing the marketing myself. Now I've built everything out, so I don't have to do any of that myself. But also, one thing that people don't talk about is that when you build out really solid SOPs and systems, you can leverage offshore labor and pay like 20% of onshore labor costs oh, and get yeah. the same if yeah. not better service. So, so my, it's so funny you mentioned that. Yeah, I've got six people working for me offshore. And my bill is less than six thousand USD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what, and, and part what of the they, reason they, why I was late. Oh, go ahead, Andy. I was saying, what are they doing for you? We have Customer a manager service. of PNL. He manages everything: hiring, firing, dealing with other, dealing with mechanics, making sure the entire business is run properly. We're making good numbers, and, he, and he's, he's entirely he, on GP gross profit. Mm -hmm. But hold on, and but then, he, he's. But hold on, he, he's offshore? He's offshore, yeah. So you have an offshore, non-body in business that is a major player within the organization. My, yeah, my entire company. So my technicians are the only people that live in the in Canada. Everyone is offshore. And they run the entire business from answering calls, booking jobs, negotiating with suppliers, hiring and firing, marketing. Everything is done by them. And I just look at the numbers. Crazy. So. Real quick, Andy, you have Emmy, right? I do have Emmy. And she's a rock star that lives in North yep. Carolina. Yep. So back, I would say, years before you hired her, you kind of heard of virtual assistants, but it really wasn't a big thing. Now it's it's on every point. Everybody has one yep. in some fashion. But um, the reason I was late, because I was actually, we were checking out a property for a storage facility that we just bought. And we had to go over pretty much the logistics of it with our Philippines team. They're going to be running the software that we'll be using for all the facilities. And if you have an issue and you have customer service or management, they're the ones you're going to be talking to. And what we do is we provide them with the basic ground, you know, the ground rules of, of the facility and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But as far as like labor goes, they handle all of it. And they are about half the price anybody can touch it here to mm -hmm. do the same thing. 
<laughs> so, uh, Philippines, dude, South this is a great Africa. episode to, to, to be on, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. There's Philippines, there's South Africa, where there's like almost no accent. And there's yeah. Latin America, which is, I, I like Latin America because the time zone, it's the same time zone, right? Yeah. I never have to worry about these guys burning out because they work nights. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Quality is really high. South Africa is a little known place. The salaries are low too, but they're like, they have really good English there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone, and, and whenever I think of offshore, it's the Philippines. That's like the yeah, main. No, um, I, I mean, offshore is around the world, right? Like I, yeah, I, no, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, I've never even thought about South Africa yeah. for, or even yeah, Latin America. Yeah, I don't use Philippines because the time zone always bothers me. I'm like, I don't expect these guys to be working i want long-term so i don't consider them the virtual agents they're just my team i guess all there is there's no onshore they're not agents they're not virtual to anyone my entire team is that's the team running the business right that's the main right, the whole team right the whole te- right the whole team is geographically yeah. dispersed so what does it matter if they're in there's, anywhere there's, yeah you're right time zone is yeah no the time zone part is absolutely significant right so i want these guys to be here for the long term these guys have been here for a long time and i just don't Maybe people are just used to it, but just as a human being, I'm like, listen, are you going to be working nights for the rest of your life? It doesn't make any sense to me. Hmm. Like, it's rough. And, and, and so do you use a third party? What, what, is, what service do you use to get offshore employees? No, I, I, I have contacts there. That I, I have my own recruiter there that we work together, yeah. and uh, we, we do this for other businesses as well. So part of my services are that when I, so when I build out your SOPs, you build out your system for your company, we build out the automations and then whatever can't be automated, we use um, Latin American labor that I bring in, train and everything for you. The hmm. goal is I work with companies where if they are they want to build a business that's going to be completely hands off, very efficient, easy and cheap to run while still growing, I'm that person they call. Yeah, I mean, that's like music that. to anybody's ears that, you know, yeah. has ever picked up a phone for and booked jobs. <laughs> right or done you know customer follow-up i mean it's all those things that um you know in my head um i physically need somebody here and then again i've never considered offshoring certain aspects of those businesses and it's my it's my risk aversion and that's my the, hold up yeah the thing is we didn't hire like a manager like we're looking for an executive in our business sometimes you find talent that's so good that you're like hey this guy can move up and i this is a solid talent right and he's loyal and yep. he gets and he gets you're like, listen, I have no choice but to let him. He built his way up there. Redevelop a position just for someone. Yeah, pardon? I said, or sometimes you meet someone that has so much just uh, potential and, and, and drive that you kind of yeah. develop a position just for them. Exactly. Right? Um, so- and, and that's the thing. It's like, a, it's like a, shit. It's like football or basketball. If you can build a, an SOP around someone, right, or, or around mm-hmm. a certain role, mm-hmm then whoever puts whoever you put in that role especially if it's a hey this is a three to five year average role as in most people don't they don't they don't last past three to five years in this role because they move on or whatever mm-hmm. well the sop is built for that role instead mm-hmm. of for well now that you're here you have a different understanding of things we have to kind of adjust for your understanding versus whatever i mm-hmm. i uh, hope i'm understand i hope i'm uh explaining that the way, way I, to understand. <laughs> the way I the way I heard that was the Green Bay Football Packers, thirteen time world champion, most wins in NFL history, have a pedigree of having quarterbacks sit behind other quarterbacks. Brett Favre sat behind Don the Major Man Mikowski, went out, got himself about three MVPs, a Super Bowl oh, championship, wait. Hall of Fame. Aaron Rodgers sat behind the Brett Favre for three years. Went out four MVPs, got himself a Super Bowl. Jordan Love, future Hall of Fame quarterback of the Green Bay Football Packers, sat behind Aaron Rodgers in two of his four MVP seasons, and he's going to go out there and slay the Bears on opening <laughs> weekend of football and, and and lead the Packers to a Super Bowl before Dak Prescott or any jabroni down there in Big D Dallas even sniffs, sniffs an NFC championship game again. Oh That's my prediction. Winning tradition. You just said it, Casey. You build a system of winning, and yeah. you insert somebody in there. You adjust. We know Jordan Love is going to be a more mobile quarterback than Aaron Rodgers. 
right? And we know he's going to go out there, sling the old football, get out of the pocket, and catch some well. W's this year. Yeah, yeah, why, yeah, he's moving the steering wheel weird. What are you doing? Are you leaving? Are you leaving the I shade? have a steering wheel tray that my computer's on. Please. <laughs> and they yeah. call it culture, but culture is just how we do things here, right? This is all it is. Yeah. No, I like, like that. The, like the Green Bay Packers, a culture of winning. That's what they do. Yeah. This is how we do it. It's literally a smarter, not yeah. harder concept of a business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, and, okay, so let's talk about this. Now that we're not talking about football, I really wanted to talk about football. Do you watch football there? Is there? I used to love football back in the day when I was younger. Sure. When, I, when I used to live in England and I first moved to Canada, Tampa Bay Buccaneers were my team, and then they won the championship. And it was just so downhill after that that I was like, it's true. It's Wait, you're talking, about, you're talking about when they won like, you're talking about when oh, they won four. 20 years ago, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, Trent Dilfer. Trent Dilfer was. No, no. Trent Dilfer won with the Ravens. Who was no. the quarterback? Brad Johnson. No, Gruden, Gruden coached him. He was yeah. it Brad Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, no, Brad I remember Gruden. yeah, he's such a. Yeah, him. Trent Dilfer won one with the Ravens. Yeah, the Buccaneers, the, the quarterback did not win that Super Bowl. Derek Brooks, uh, Warren Yo, Sapp. All the, the defense. defense all defense. defense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the. That was the Buccaneers and Raiders, and I and I wanted the yeah. Raiders. Was that Buccaneers? Yeah, the Buccaneers. Two thousand one was right before I joined the Army. Uh, it wasn't yeah. even close. It was when John Gruden got no. fired by the Raiders, went to the Bucks, yeah. and then he beat them. And yeah. was, nothing happened after that for the Bucks. So Tom Brady came in. No, it's true. And then they bought themselves a championship. God bless, uh, you know, Tom Brady. And then, uh, yeah, can't can't fault Tom for wanting. Warm weather, you know. I mean, he got a, he got a Super Bowl championship and a divorce out of his move to Florida. He, he, so. he proved the point. He was like, "I'm not a system quarterback. I can win anywhere." And I think he just proved that. He's like, "I took the worst team in the league. I got him a championship. That's like I'm the best of all sports. I'm the the greatest he, in all sports." He, that was a big f you to Bill Belichick and everybody yeah. else in the history of his life, and it worked. Like he yeah. he won. At the end of the day, I I, I cannot stand Tom Brady. And the guy is still a winner. The no, guy is still the, he, the GOAT. He just, he's the greatest in all sports, though, if you think about it. Yes. No one can well, do what Tom Brady has done. It's hard to say. Like, I'm not – I'm trying to be the most objective person. I have no – I have no – But uh, didn't Serena or Venus do some pretty crazy shit? Didn't she do a bunch of uh, – They both did. Think, uh, Serena. He won, he won six world champions or world championships, six Super Bowls or whatever. But didn't Serena or Venus, one of the sisters, just set an, a phenomenal record that can't really be broke? That's an yeah, individual wins. effort too, right? You remember that's yeah. tennis is oh, that's individual. True. Effort. Tom Brady yeah. took what's a, a fifty-two players in the football team, and his his impact is so high that he can take the worst team in the league and make them yeah. a championship contender as one person in a fifty-two team, a fifty-two person team. That is completely different than an individual performer. Well, he did pretty much bring his Pats teammates like, over to Tampa Bay. How many? He brought Gronk. He brought Gronk and like three oh, guys. Dude, Aaron Rodgers yeah. brought ten guys to the Jets, and now they're trying That's to get dumb. Bakhtiari. I know. Like Aaron That's Rodgers, like, who said you didn't surround me with any talent, and then he goes to the Jets and takes the same guys with him. Yeah. <laughs> You're better off trying to get the coach gone before just doing that. You know. Yeah. Like Michael Jordan won with the Bulls. And then the Bulls went to the yeah. finals or whatever without him, right? Like that's uh, not... they went to they went to the Eastern Conference Finals the next year without him. Yeah, that's not as the Knicks as taking the worst the... team in the league like LeBron consistently does and goes and wins championships. Wait, LeBron, LeBron, now? LeBron, LeBron, LeBron's terrible. Let's not talk about LeBron because <laughs> then I like you, our LeBron is garbage. He's not. He shouldn't even be mentioned in the goat conversation. Jordan <laughs> would own his ass one on one. Cultural icon. I, I'm looking at a picture of Michael Jordan right now. LeBron. I'm going to stick with I can't stand that guy. Even say one on one. I would say Jordan's Jordan. team against LeBron's team. You yeah. know? I think what LeBron's prime was it was it Cavs or was it the Heat? Well, he went to the Heat, won a championship with Bosch and Wade, and Wade had already won one yeah. with Shaq. Yeah. And then he yeah. went back to Cleveland to get the old hometown team, a W. And then he mm-hmm. won one in. And then he won one in L.A. Did he win two in Cleveland? Or was no, it two in Miami? He, he, one in Cleveland. Stacked up their team, there was really no way to beat them. 
Oh and yeah. Then, oh no, oh I'm not. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm, I am not defending the uh, the the KD uh, era of the Golden State Warriors. Like Steph and Draymond were winning without KD, and that was yeah. his yeah. little sauce. Uh, no, LeBron won one. Uh, oh. What's that? It's LeBron versus Golden State because Kyrie only played one time, and that's when they won. That was when they were, yeah, they were, yeah, they were, they were, they were the cap, yeah, they, with the caps. But then did he win two in LA? I know he won the COVID year. One in LA. One in LA. I think he had four total. Did he win two in Cleveland? Yeah, four, two in Miami, one in LA, one in oh, Cleveland. Oh, okay. There it is. Two in Miami. That's what it was. Yeah. There we go. Like, we, we've gone down the NFL route, the NBA route. I think someone one time said in one of our reviews, they're like, yeah, it's good, except for they fucking talk about football too much. Does that feel familiar, yeah. Casey? Dude, that was like, yeah, because it was last year, obviously, because it's the only football season we've been talking on, on the show. But yeah, yeah, I remember that review came in like, yeah, it's a good show, except for all the talk about football. Well, you know, dude, for that guy who hopefully is still listening, yeah, get fucking ready, man. Because like, <laughs> football season is about to start, and I don't also, really care about any other team except for my team. Same with Andy. So we're probably going to mention football a couple of here's, times. Here's the other thing. It's the Trash Talk Business Podcast. We yeah. give ourselves a lot of liberty with that title. We can talk <laughs> business. We can talk trash. We can talk junk removal. We can talk shit. And it's a well, podcast. The, right? The FCC well, bringing, does not apply. Yeah. Yeah. We're bringing value gold here with you, Zara, here. Like, it's like, hey, spit out some value, yep. knowledge bombs. Okay. Transition into sports yep. or <laughs> who's better than who, you know? <laughs> well, the other thing is, like, we're, we're right, but to the point, right? We we put the work in outside of the podcast to find guys like Uzar to to find this. Like, I, I, I this is what I tell people all the time. I actually, as soon as this podcast is over, I'm going to record a video. Back in 2000, February of 2019, I recorded a video, put it on LinkedIn, and it basically went on like a 45 to 60 second rant about how much I fucking love lunch because I love lunch and I need to do one on ones every day. And the fact of the matter is. There's a good chance that if you have an amazing product or service, I'm going to want to buy it from you or vice versa. I want to sell you my amazing product or service. Mm -hmm. So let's go have lunch. I don't give a shit who pays. Hell, I, d I came from lunch. I had a lunch with a restoration company today. We're going to be a vendor for their, them, right? Because that's a very natural progression and junk removal. And like, we got someone like Uzar, it's like, hey, the more you talk, the more I'm like, man, everything you're saying is shit that I need in my business. Mm -hmm. And it's not mm -hmm. a, like, the, 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 the only thing I, the only, I don't know if I told Uzar this, maybe I just said it to Taylor. I was like, hey, as long as this guy comes on and doesn't fucking turn into a sales pitch, we're good. I want to hear new things, mm -hmm. right? Because like everything you're saying is dead on. It's what business owners need to grow. We talked about that at the very beginning of the show, right? This is to scale your business. If if, if your goal is to stay, you know, if, is to be where you're at today in a year from now, this is not the podcast for you. Because this podcast is about what are the best processes and tools and systems. And often it's not what Casey and I know today. It's what we can learn by surrounding mm -hmm. ourselves with really, really smart people. So no, I, I, I love the fact that you've come on and you're, you're striking a chord. You're, you're reiterating what Casey and I have said. And now you're also striking a chord and going and talking about next level stuff that hell, yeah. I, need, I know I need to do this shit. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's irritating me because I know it applies to me. We haven't even scratched the surface of what's possible. We're just like talking such generalities. Like there's so much that yeah. we can do. And it's, I think it's amazing, especially if you spend the time and effort building that automated business that can scale up. And I think the real winner, like you really made it in business where you built it in a way where it continues to grow every year. And you're like, wow, these numbers are looking amazing, but you don't do anything. So, so those just, are two questions. So, so I want, I want to, I want to talk about two things. First one, um, is, well, uh, the first one is, okay, the phone rings, right? Because mm -hmm. you started going down that scenario, and that's interesting to me. Because every one of us, the phone rings, email comes in, text message comes in, online request comes in, right? Our customer contacts us. So mm -hmm. right now, our process is simple. But we'll, we'll do a phone call. Phone call comes in. We qualify the customer. We go through, not a, a, it's not an exact script. It is, it is questions, right? First question we always ask is, have you used this in the past? Because yeah. if they have, that, that cuts out later work, right? We've already, we already have all the contact info. If they have not, then we say, hey, where are you located roughly? We want to make sure they're in the right county or the general, general area that we service, right? And then, and then we ask for their, their um, information, name, address, phone number, city, state, zip. How'd you hear about us? 
Mm-hmm. From there, we build the customer profile. We talk about their project. We determine at that point, can we book the job? Do we have enough information? Or do we need to go out and do an estimate? Right? Let's go down the estimate route. We go out to the, we, we book the estimate. We select a date and time. Our estimator goes out there, gives them a quote. At that point, they say yes or no. And then we book the job if they say yes. If they say no, we have a, th- a follow-up the day of. We have a follow-up three days later, a follow-up seven days later. That That is our, our flow right now. So what gaps or opportunities do you see in that standard flow that you can come in to, A, decrease the time, and B, increase the likelihood that they're going to close those jobs? So here's the thing. First of all, like when people ask, like, have you heard of this before? Have you used this before? I think that some CRMs do this and we do this too, is that if they have used this before, the information automatically does pop up. So I tell my guys, mm-hmm. don't ask that question. Greet them by their first name. Hey, Jeff, thanks for calling. How are you doing? Like that, that, like that creates that first relationship. And number two, I want to keep these guys on the phone as long as possible. My SOP is designed to keep these guys on the phone as long as possible so they don't shop around. You spend more time talking to someone, you don't get the price right away. You have to ask them what their problems are. Just try to really nail down what you're solving. And then they don't call around because they're exhausted after calling you and just use you instead. And then it's, we well, uh, it's, it's information unload. So the more information you're giving mm. them, it's not that the information's bad information to them. It, it's new information. Yeah. We're explaining how we're different. Here's how we do things differently. Asking them questions about their problem. What have they tried before? As just going down the rabbit hole that way to like make them feel understood. Because I have learned, this is what I've learned, okay? Ease to getting quote does not help at all. The more you make a customer work to get to your service, the higher conversion rate. It's the IKEA effect in a way. You let like your to IKEA- wander. Yeah. And I want to take them on the phone and keep them on the phone as long as possible because I'm also building that relationship with them too, right? But if you just say, hey, thanks for calling, blah, 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 trying to get them off the phone as fast as you can, then it's easier to shop around. They don't even want to talk to you, right? But I have gone the opposite route. Works well. That's exactly. So for me, with my personal experience, if I could get in front of a customer or client, I could damn near guarantee the joke, right? And it wasn't because of how I talk or any kind of salesy bullshit. It was simply because I can give them all of the information that they need to know versus, yeah, I'll do this estimate for you, even though you probably don't know everything I can do for you. And Mm -hmm. what I've realized is when it's on the phone, yeah, the whole pricing structure on the phone, I do two things. I'll give, if I have basic trailer pricing, I'll give it to someone. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's, I mean, I'm transparent that way. Yeah, this is what I charge for a full trailer. This is what I charge for labor only, blah, blah, blah. But I listen to them. What is it you're trying to accomplish? Not, hey, what all do you have? What are you trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I have found, oh, we're trying to get our house ready to sell. But the phone call started off with, with, I need to get rid of some stuff. That's two different subjects. Those are two very different conversations. So the second one, I'm trying to get my house ready to sell. That tells me there's going to be some shit in the attic. There's going to be some stuff in the, in the garage. Your backyard probably has junk. You have a shed, so on and so forth. You probably have a bunch of clothes you don't want. So you start getting that information out. Say, so yeah, you know, we also donate, you know, whatever percentage to local charities for clothing, furniture. So next thing you know, that little clean up like hey i just had a few items now it turns into can you fill up your trailer today come back tomorrow and help us move some shit around or whatever you're upselling without having to really upsell you're just giving them more information yeah. and to your point is our so when you're like keep them on the phone as long as possible that's sales tactics 101 that i learned when i was selling cars mm-hmm. because you want them to almost get beaten down to the point where they're like okay um, I'm fucking coming in. I'm going to buy a car from you. Not like you force me into your sales trickery. It's more like, Hey, I have all the information I really need yeah. to make an informed decision. And I don't want to call around and go through this process again. 100%. Let's, let's talk about the difference between a salesperson and an order taker, right? An order taker is the one that call the, the answers the phone. They're like, customers like, I want this, 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 and they just give it to them. But a salesperson knows there's there are three steps ahead they're like okay this person wants this but i know if he wants this he's probably looking at this or this i wonder why he makes this decision and you you go 
three or four steps down deep and you become a trusted advisor more than a salesperson, right? You're not an order taker. Yeah. Anymore. So I teach my guys, there's no order taking going on. You are the expert. You have to know what their problems are ahead of time before they know and solve those problems. You sell more too that way. But that those customers don't feel like they're being sold to as well. They're well, having their problems solved. What's interesting here is as I'm sitting here listening, what I do and what I teach are the complete opposite. I'm having this like introspective moment. When I'm <laughs> on the phone with customers, I talk to them as long as possible. And I always tell people, if you're going to talk about, for me at least, when we talk about price, I want price to be brought up in the 90th percentile of the conversation. That means if it's a five-minute conversation, mm -hmm. I want to talk about price at about four and a half minute mark. Because yeah. the whole time, right, what you're talking about is it comes natural, right? They call me for a reason. Oh, I want to get rid of some stuff, right? You're right. An order taker, like, cool, what do you want to get rid of? I often go the opposite route. I'm always like, cool, what do you have going on? Oh, just cleaning up around the house. Oh, kids moving out or what do you, right? Or, oh, you're getting ready for a sale. Like, right, there's a reason why you called me today. And I want to talk about that, right? And then whenever they give me the address, I always, always add in something. Like, hey, oh, yeah, I grew up in that neighborhood. Or, hey, I've been to that restaurant down the street. What do you think about that? Or, hey, where's your favorite, what, what whatever, right? And the whole time, because your your point is dead on, that trusted advisor. Now I'm having a conversation with someone I know, and then they know me, and they know that I know them. And so by the time we get to the transactional part of it, it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to be the one providing them service. So that's how I operate. However, I'm thinking through my SO, as I'm sitting here, I, I think about my SOP. I also know how I train my guys. And I'm like, hey, get to the customer's information, figure out what they need done, get the job fucking booked. Mm -hmm. Right. It's very transactional. And yet Maybe. I don't do that. I'll, I'll sit on yeah. the phone and stretch it out because I like talking to people. I want to know what's going on with their mm -hmm. lives. Right. It's I find that interesting. Huh. And to, what you said before Casey even joined us is there's certain things that you either knew or picked up on or learned in business that you didn't realize was unique to you. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where I'm at yeah. in, in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, the anti-sale is the most effective sale out there where you start asking the customer to justify why they're making that decision. You're like, why? Why are you doing this? Way? Like, ask them why you're doing certain things, right? And this, don't try to sell them. Be like, make them want to, in a way, make them sell why they need it to you. Why they need to get what that, what they need to get done to you and why you're the person for them. Like, why did you pick this service? Like, But that's more advanced consultative sales. I don't know if that's yeah. going to work in, in service industry, but in my particular industry, yeah. when someone wants to work with me, I really try to nail down what the problem they're trying to solve. And if I'm the right person for that problem versus just being like, Hey, I can help you, but I don't know if I can or not. No, I mean, certainly even in consulting, when I tell, it's interesting when I tell customers or potential customers, they're not a good fit for me. They want me more, mm -hmm. right? They're, it's like that revert. You want what you can't have. Mm -hmm. And when I tell people, like, if you, if you reach out to me, I, I there was a guy who reached out to me last week and wanted to bring me on as a consultant. Um, because he was, he was looking to get in a junk removal. And I was like, hey, let's have a 15-minute intro call. Within five minutes, I'm like, hey, man, I'm not I'm not going to let you hire me because I'm, I'm I'm not going to add value. I'll spend the next 20 minutes on the phone with you because I, you know, I was driving and I was like, yeah, we can have this conversation. I can give you some things. And and he's like, he, he texts me afterwards. He's like, I wish I could hire you for something right now. Like, at the end of the day, like, he didn't even – I gave him the information he needed, and I told him, like, I, he was like, he wanted me – he wanted to hire me to convince him that the decision he was making was the right one and like talk him into it. And it's like, but it's not like, this is what are we doing here? Like, let's not, let's not have this conversation. And yeah. Because you're building in this, this perceived scarcity to the end consumer or this perceived, uh, the deal goes away if you don't say yes right now. Mm -hmm. hmm. But you're right. Yeah. That is more advanced. Yeah. Either. A, a compli I would say, I would say complicated decision-making mm -hmm. even with you. It's like, if I reached out to you and I really like what you have and you're like, yeah, your company's not the right size or you're, you know, it's not a good fit. I'd be like, well, what makes me a good fit? What, what yeah. size do I need to be? Right. Like you, you start arguing, like, no, I am. I'm a good customer. But I'll pay. <laughs> like I want to hang out with you. <laughs> yeah. Once so, you triple the size, we'll work together. <laughs> oh yeah. The other thing, I, this is something that I also realized in one of my businesses. Um, when I increased my price, this was not in junk removal. Um, this was a different business I have. When I increased my price, I got more customers. Because the perceived value of my time went up. 
that's the first thing I learned mm-hmm. in business. I wanted, I thought I'd be the cheapest guy mm-hmm. out there. And then I was like, people don't take you seriously in service. This is not like product, right? You can't service people expect high prices, really good people. Yep. But then when you charge high prices, you actually want to do a good job because you're getting paid so well to do a good job, right? So that's what and, I've learned it, too. And you always want to, as a, as, a, as a provider like me, for example, I do consulting calls. I put it down to 60 minutes. I make sure I have at least 15 minutes on the back end so I'm not jumping. Because if that extra mm-hmm. 15 minutes makes right. a huge difference in a breakthrough, I'm going to give you the 15 minutes and I'm not charging you for it. Because, because mm-hmm. I, I already know you're paying me top dollar. I'm more willing to give more because I want to make sure you have a great experience versus, right? If I'm, you know, discount, then it's like, nope, I got to hop. You know, you, you only paid for 60 minutes. I got to hop. I got another call. I got other more mm-hmm. important things to do. And the other thing I realized is I watched this with, uh, there was a, this guy on YouTube, maybe like six months ago I saw him. He, he approached this woman who was a psychologist and she, he said, okay, she teaches like a 40 hour course, 80 hour course, so like maybe an 80 hour course. He's like, cool. I want to pay for four hours of your time, but I will pay you whatever you get paid for your 80 hour course. I will pay you that, but I want to, but I only want four hours of your time. So this woman spent two weeks basically taking taking an 80 hour course and getting it down to the most important and impactful four hours. He paid her the full run rate. Cause he's like, I'm, I, my, my time means more to me than my money. And I don't mm-hmm. want a discounted variety. So then he ended up getting four hours of only the best of the best of the best. And she spent two weeks preparing for it. So it's like, you're going to put the, you're going to put the time in either way. You either put the time in on the front end and learn your craft and really get good at it. Or you're going to put the time in on the back end, getting paid less to figure it out along the way. And now with yeah. you, in your case, the, the other thing I really like about you in particular, almost every other person, we only had a few, but every other person that's come onto this podcast that's pitched a, a service or a, an idea or a software or a solution. They've come from the solutions based industry or the software based industry, or mm-hmm. they've come from, Hey, I think it's a good idea. And I want to be the next Uber of the thing versus you. You're like, Hey, I built this out internally within my business and I found a way to replicate it across different industries. That's, that's what's interesting. Yeah. And to that second point I wanted to get to earlier. So my, you know, I, I can't remember what my first point was. You answered it. Oh, it was the, hey, from the script, how do we get there? And that one nugget there about keeping them on the phone longer is my takeaway there. Second piece is you say now that you're still an owner-operator. However, your your means of operation is really you go on to a tool and look at numbers. And from those KPIs, you can determine some things within your business. What is that? What does that look like? Like what KPIs I look at? Yeah, what KPIs? What does it tell you about your business? How many hours a week are you working in that business? What auto- what authority do you have within the business versus the autonomy the guys in the field have? What is what is that? I want to paint a picture of what it looks like today for someone who is spending a lot more time working on the business than in the business. So the things that I look at for my business is I look at the number of uh, jobs per day, calls per day, conversion rate, um, and I look at the. So the way it works is like we have a diagnostic or the evaluation plus the conversion rate for the job afterwards. I look at the mechanics follow up rate on that. And then I look up like, you know, what are our SEO stats? What are what's our, how much are we spending on Google ads? How much are we spending on YouTube ads? And I look at how much each you know, Google my business is, how much each is generating in calls. And I have all I given to me to report on a daily basis. But I look at mostly that stuff on a monthly basis because too much variance on the daily side. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and then that's effectively all that I look at. And if I find like, if any of those things are out of whack, I talk to the right person in the company. So like, for example, if we're getting too many claims and our NPS score is going low, I'm like, I talk to my general manager, like what's going on here. And then we have that process for that. If our call volume is low, I talk to my marketing contractor. I'm like, what, give me the stats for Google. Like what's going on with our, um, our rankings, what's going on with our daily average visitors, all that stuff. Right. Um, that's kind of like each thing that I look at has a process behind it. So if something is off and not right, I know exactly which process to follow and who to send that message to. Hmm. I, I love it. So we do that. The, the troubleshooting per, is also per, one of the. Yeah. In terms of hours per week, I, I would put it less than an hour a week. And that's, I mean, for me as an owner of business, that's where I want to get to. 
I even mm-hmm. said that like uh, when I when I hired our the president of our company uh, a little over a year ago. I said my goal is to in eighteen months get to an hour on my business a week. And the reason I came up with the hour was I saw a keynote speaker who did similar. She uh, had salons, like three salon locations, and she says she spends an hour a week on her business. Or it, what she said, and in, like when in I said because she hour, physically yeah. she has one hour meeting, but she it's like, but yeah, it's it's like she checks the numbers it's, once a week, goes over it with the team, and moves on. I don't even do that. I just check the numbers. I don't even think it's an hour a week. I think it's less than that. But like, like for example, hmm. like last month. I got married as my honeymoon and it was the best month ever at my company. And I had zero time invested in that business. But Congratulations that's what on the wedding. Yeah. But that's what I mean by uh, you want to make sure your business is not something that just sustains itself without you, but ends up growing without you. Our profits this year versus last year, I think in the last three months, we made as much profit as we did all the last year. Hmm. And I, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to like help others with as well. But it's just, I've done it for myself. Like it's just, it's not like I have anything to sell. I just, it's, here's my system. Here's what I've done and how I figured it out. And the same thought process could be useful for a lot of people out there. Oh no, I, I, everything you're saying is dead on. And it's the, for me, uh, being very honest, it's the, uh, the technology, like I've used Zapier in the past Mm -hmm. and and the building in widgets. So you know, tools talk to each other. That's where I've struggled. And so I've done things harder, not smarter. And mm-hmm. I pull my own reports and I, and right, I'm sitting here in Excel spreadsheets, you know, it's like, I know what to look for and it doesn't come uh, automatically, right? It's not automated. It's all, it's all still manually driven. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to do so that. Everything, yeah, everything you're saying makes total sense to me. Yeah, I used to do that too in the past. I would just be so lazy. I'm like, oh, I got to pull out this report and do this. But now it just gets done for me automatically. I just look at it. It's so much better now. It's so much better. Yeah, like I pull my my P and L once a week from yeah. uh, Google, uh, and really I I don't get too worked up about the weekly, certainly the monthly, or you know rolling thirty days or rolling twenty days. I find has the less least amount of variance. I look at my P and L quarterly basis. Yeah, I find yeah. For way. us, yeah, we we have a lot of rate in junk families. We have a lot of variance month by month. Mm-hmm. So rolling 90 days is normally my, rolling 90 days is my best. So it's not, it's, you know, speaking the same thing, but rolling 90 days is where I yeah. spend the majority of my time. Cause yeah, mm-hmm. weekly, I look at it, say, do we win or lose the week? That's pretty much as far as I want to right? And I normally, yeah. normally weekly is top line revenue only I'm looking at because very, because yeah. expenses can be such a variance on, you know, exactly. payroll week, thing, non-payroll weeks, everything like, else. I've been in situations where like my, First two weeks have been so bad that I'm like, this is going to zero. I'm going to go bankrupt yeah. this month. And then the last, <laughs> two weeks, I felt so much revenue. I'm like, I'm just going to be hands off. I don't care about these numbers. Once a month max, so, once a quarter, so, only, oh, it's too much stress. So there you go. So you want to talk about entrepreneurship? Here's a guy that's like, I spent less than one hour a week in my business. Uh, I spent a month long gone with my new bride at a honeymoon. And oh, by the way, I still look at my PL after two weeks and think about quitting everything and giving up. Right? <laughs> daily. It's so bad. Dude, you're you're so daily. I know. And it's like, well, because there's this idea. I, I've met so many people, especially in Junker, they're like, man, you got like five, six trucks. Like, man, you just makes me like fucking like life is good. Like, you don't have to think about shit. I'm like, no, no. no like, it's, every, like, I have. Well, I, this, it's volatile yeah. with the different years. I, so for me, it's funny. So when I look at it on monthly, I already know halfway through the month. I this is how this is how my month works almost verbatim. First week of the month, I'm negative because I've paid almost all my bills in the first of the month. Right. Mm-hmm. Second the week of the month, I'm almost at break even. Third week of the month, I'm past break even. I can also look at how much money I've made and spent on the third week of the month, and I can tell you how much money I'm going to make in the month because the last week of the month I have the least amount of bills, mm-hmm. and then and so I know my right. It's fixed. It, it's your fixed expense against your variable expense. And I know the last week of the month I make my money and I feel really good. Right. And then the 31st hits and then the first hits the next day and my trucks payments come out and my building payments come out on the first of the month. And I'm already back to, you know, negative as of the first day of the month. Mm-hmm. And so I don't get you right. So that monthly flow, like I, I, I watch it. So I don't panic or like in June when we had three payrolls in June, like going into June, knowing we're going to have three payrolls, I'm like, yeah, like the month of June is going to look like crap on paper and May and July are going to look inflated. 
why are Fine. you guys doing that? Like, I I got rid of that. That's the worst. I just do monthly payrolls only. We don't do, we don't, we don't have any three payment months. That's awful. Like, that's such a killer How do you do right monthly there. payroll? I, I just tell these guys you get paid once a month at the, at the end of the month. <laughs> you, just, you just tell them, fuck. Uh, I can one. tell They're... you if I did. No, I would actually rather go to weekly payroll than bi-weekly. Yeah. No, the bi-weekly is awful. Like, that, I, I can't do that. Uh, those those three weeks so, where I'm like, this so I, is a great month. yeah, no, no. I had I had a business in the past where we did the first and the fifteenth. Yeah, and I like that. The problem with the first and the fifteenth is you can really fuck up overtime really quick because overtime is based on the week, not based on the first and the fifteenth. Mm. We don't so do overtime. Would, you, oh, you guys are all because you guys are all ten ninety nines in the field or what or. How no, you not do no, overtime? They're subcontractors, but uh, we don't do overtime. And uh, I'm thinking of bringing in like a bonus versus, based on number of hours you bill. That like you get more, but I haven't explored that yet. Is it okay? So okay, so that's a Canadian. So in was in, in I was gonna say Wisconsin, but it's all states. After 40 hours, you have to get overtime in the states unless you're in a exempt class. Interesting. So if you're doing physical labor, yeah. So in yeah. the states, if you're doing physical labor. Like mechanic work or junk removal, you automatically are overtime after forty. Here's what's unique about the way we structured our business, right? So we have our technicians; they're subcontractors. Um, they get paid, but they lease the vans from us. They need their own tools, and then we tell them on their contract: you have to get at least ten percent of your revenue from outside sources as part of your employment, your contract. So, so, payment. so, 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 so in the United States, we call them. W-2s are 1099. So a W-2 yeah. is a no-shit employee, and you pay for their Medicare, Medicaid, yeah, yeah. Social Security, all that shit. So is it the same with you guys, or what is it in there in Canada? Yeah, they call them T-4s. They're normal employees. We don't have those. Okay, so great. So everyone's a subcontractor. What do you call yeah. them? Yeah, we just they're just subcontractors, and they're supposed to get work from other people. Like, we tell them, we Got encourage it. them, like, listen, here, run some Kijiji ads, run some Craigslist ads. Like, you're not, mm-hmm. you're not supposed to be our – not, we're not supposed to be your only client. <laughs> So what? So what? Got it. And but, but when they go get that outside work, are they running it through your company in your no, system? They can drive. No, nope. They do it completely this independent. Is, completely independent. Yeah, they can use our vans because they're leasing the vans from us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at that point, the van is theirs. For yeah. I mean, not right. They and their tools are theirs. So you're really mm-hmm. a lead gen company that's sending them leads all day. Uh, it's 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 a funny place because we're not sending them leads because they gotta do things when they work on our clients they gotta do things our way where our uniforms right. Oh, okay, okay, you're right. Maybe not. Yeah, not. No. But you're right. You're right. Okay, that's fair. Not a lead gen company. Lead gen was a shit word. You are a yeah. You are you're you're a general contractor. You contract out them to go fucking turn wrenches. Yeah, in in a way, and, yeah. And structurally, that's true. And structurally, we are general contractors. But whenever we send those technicians out, they have to wear our uniform yeah which is interesting so in the states that's one of actually the disqualifiers if someone has to wear a uniform that automatically makes them a w-2 employee looks like a w-2 employee not Mm -hmm. a 1099 subcontractor what if we said you manipulate their schedule to your schedule yeah also so if you manipulate the schedule so pretty much if i say hey you have to be here at 7 a.m and then you're gonna i'm gonna be done with you at 5 p.m., right, and you have to wear my uniform, the big government is going to say, that's a oh, W-2 yeah. employee. Okay, because so they pick, technically, their own, they pick their own schedule. They, they huh. Every week, they set their schedule of when they want to book, and then we book according to what okay. they, they pick. Oh, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. Right, well, that's, a, we, find yeah. That. yeah. that's interesting. Well, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's gig work. I mean, that's what Uber is. Mm-hmm. Like, you press the button, you say, hey, I'm, I'm on, I can go do rides. Versus someone tells you, yeah, week, you know, on the Thursday, the week before, hey, what days are you working? And we're going to schedule, you know, we're going to fill your schedule accordingly. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this, you know what? This is why I love this podcast and why I love not doing show work, right? Because, and I'm very transparent about this. When you, when I first got your email on Podmatch, so Podmatch is a third party service we use to, to find other podcasters. And a lot of the ones we get are super fucking salesy. Like, I think this guy would be great to teach your people about financial investments. And it's like, it's all a bunch of financial advisors and their virtual assistants. And I can't remember what yours said. I was like, man, this guy sounds like he could be awesome or he could be just pitching us some bullshit software. Mm-hmm. And either way, we'll shake them dice because, <laughs> right? Like, who, again, we're not the judge and jury. We're the, you know, and again, we did have, we've had at least one guy I know where we brought him on and 
it wasn't great for him, right? We we basically said what not to do on a podcast. Uh, don't come on a podcast and try to sell your business that you haven't figured out how it works yet mm-hmm. um, to guys that have been doing this for more than 10 minutes. So anyways, whatever. Um, and it was a good learning experience and like no, no, no fault on that guy. It's just, Hey man, his, his, his uh, business idea was, you know, premature. So no, I, I love what you're doing. I'm, I will absolutely follow up with you to see how you can um, support our business because everything you're saying are my pain points. You are speaking yeah. to the, um, you're speaking to my language. That's it. And, and where we need to go organizationally. So we are more automated, right? It's one thing to delegate things. The challenge is delegating means somebody else has to do it versus automating. It means that we're being more efficient with our time. So I do like that correction you also made. It's not about getting off the phone faster. It's about having a higher quality interaction because I'd rather you spend 10 minutes in close than five minutes in not. It's yeah, really that simple. Autom- what you said, like that, that particular example, if your people that you're delegating tasks to should be doing human tasks, but anything that's admin or anything in the back end, humans should not be doing because I know. The thing about robots is robots never take time off. They never get sick. They don't have feelings. No, they, they don't just... bitch. Yeah, they don't have feelings. That's the best There's part. Nothing. There's nothing. Yeah. It's just, they work. They just do their thing in the background. More robots. All right. Let's uh let's go around the horn. Casey, we'll start with you. Top okay. takeaway well, from today's lesson on the Trash Talk Business Podcast. Two so I got three three points here. The oh. first one is um always be open for new opportunities. The reason I say that is because this has probably been one of the most um, valuable episodes that I've been a part of as far as how much I've gained from it. Right? Like, we don't even have to air this and I'm going to be taking <laughs> some some value off like big time. Um, but also, number two is always refine your, your your SOPs, your processes. I mean, you said it best, Yuzar, you said a business is just a collection of SOPs and it's it's spot on. There's nothing, nothing really to elaborate there. It's, it's, a, it's the truth. And, and I think if, if a lot of us start looking at it that way and not look at it as, Oh, I remember starting this with my own truck and blah, blah, blah. I sweat. I bled. Dude, if it's a business, don't mix your emotions with it. You have to think what's the best thing for this business. If I have to automate three or four different things and it may or may not conflict with hiring someone person, like an actual person, then so be it. It's what the business needs. And then the, the last thing is don't be afraid don't be afraid to try new things. I know Andy's going to eat this eat this up, but seriously, take that first step into different avenues. And if if, if you don't like it, at least you can have some sort of um, information on before you say no. Because if you're not doing new things in your business, you're not going to survive. Mm-hmm. Every day you said it you said it again. I mean, shit, you're full of points. You said it again. We are so far behind the actual technology technological advances that has been discovered this far and in business there's so much room for evolve uh, uh, to evolve and technology is one thing that will always evolve it will always get better every day it gets better than the, than the day before so if you're not at least utilizing that your business will always be behind mm-hmm. those are my key points uzar top takeaway from today my talk, honestly, it just proved that what I was doing of, you know, just reaching out to people, getting out there, I'm trying to increase my surface area of luck. And, and you know, that's the big thing about life, right? It's like, you don't know who you're going to meet, when you're going to meet, but as long as you're out there, just trying to increase that sur- surface area of luck to increase the chance of something serendipitous happening, you have no idea where it could be, right? Like, I was thinking about um, just the conversation that we had today. And you said, like, you just roll the dice, like, take this podcast guest out, just roll the dice. I kind of felt the same with your podcast, right? I heard about it very recently, and I just went there, and I was like, you know what? I'll reach out to these guys and see what happens, and boom, here we are. We connected, and it's – who knows who's even listening to this podcast, too, and right? So mm-hmm. – Taylor, our producer, knows. He'll yeah. tell you everybody's <laughs> name. <laughs> I love that the um, idea of rolling the dice and just – you never know what can happen. So did I, I wrote this down? I so my it's second Slack book also. Oh, Slack, yeah, Slack was the other one. So I'm 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 writing my second book. I'm writing my second and third book right now. So my my first book, which Casey leaned into a little bit, he didn't. I don't know that he even realized he did it. You, you like started yeah, quoting his, uh, Yeah, yeah. He started quoting, and I, I didn't do my shameless plug. Anyways, my first book called "Words Fucking Matter: Retrain Your Brain to Use Language That Serves You." Available on Amazon. There's my plug. <laughs> However. 
my second book I'm writing is called Phrases Fucking Matter, because there's a theme here. I want to make sure I get this right. Increase the surface area of luck. Is that what you just said? Like three yeah. times? I fucking Increase love that. Increase the surface area of luck. I, I, that's on my list. It's going to end up in the next book. I will quote you warmly and accurately. But I like that because I hate, I hate the idea of luck. And yet we know luck is the intersection of preparation and opportunity. Yeah. It's like, well, shit. The, the bigger fucking surface area, the more likelihood you're going to hit that, that, that intersection. And, and, yeah. and, I, and I'm glad. And that's, and that's why I let in a little bit about, hey, we, we took a chance on you, right? You took a chance on mm-hmm. us. We both spent the last hour and some change together. And it took has to be chance, mutually beneficial. Chance, took a chance, mm-hmm. took a chance. 100%. So, no, I, I, I appreciate that vulnerability and transparency because, you know, it, it's that naivety as a business mm-hmm. owner where it's like, yeah, I still don't know shit. And I'm going to do something different and new. That's what makes business interesting and worthwhile. So that's my top takeaway is stop being so fucking stubborn, Andy. Uh, enjoy, right? Right? Whether it's AI. We had a whole episode of AI and I avoided it. I've avoided mm-hmm. Slack. I'm fully aware of what mm-hmm. it is. And I need to lean in. And also, I love processes. And in my mm-hmm. head, no one else can write a process better than me. And, and about 10 minutes into our episode, I was like, this motherfucker's got me beat by a lot. Because he's talking about back-end automation. I'm still archaic, digging in Google Drive to figure out, you know, what I said one time, whether it worked. And what Casey said towards the end there, towards the end there, I am still the blood, sweat, and tears I remember the way it used to be guy. Mm. That can't be the default fighting position. The default fighting mm. position needs to be, hey, this is the best practice. This is where it's readily available. Hold people accountable and go out and kick ass. So, mm-hmm. I, Uzar, Casey, I appreciate both of you guys for your time today. This has been another amazing episode of the Trash Talk Business Podcast, your weekly dose of reality as a business owner and a person. Get out there, do new things, live and grow the life that you want to live. It's up to you and only you to do it. And we will see you again next week with some more great information. I'm Andy. He's Casey, along with Uzar. Have a great week.